Let's begin. Terrific. So, as Daisy was saying, um, hopefully you're all here for the study overseas information session. Um, my name is Patrick and this is Daisy. Um, we'll be joined by a few guest speakers today who have taken uh, some time out of their day to join us. Um, hopefully they'll be able to stick around for some questions. Um, we've got heaps to go through. Um, so without further ado, I think it, it makes sense to really to get into it. So before we start, just to, um, just to get it out of the way, really, I think we've probably spoken to most of you at one of the um, events we've had over the last couple of weeks, where we did talk about this a lot. Um, but just so everyone's aware, currently the Australian government won't let anybody back in, uh, leave the country if you're an Australian citizen or permanent resident, and no one's really doing visa exemptions unless it's for work. So at this stage, we're unfortunately probably not going to be able to have any outbound exchange for semester two this year. And we're keeping our fingers crossed that we'll be able to go ahead with it for semester one, 2022. But based on whatever happens, obviously it's an ever-changing situation. So depending on what the situation is looking like, the government along with the uh, university, sorry, along with the government advice will make a decision later this year to see if semester one, 2022 exchange can go ahead. Um, but we'll make sure we let you know before, any, before you make any non-refundable payments, like your flights or accommodation, and we've actually got some cool online alternatives that Alison will talk to you about later in the presentation. So that if you are keen to do something a bit different, you can still do that without having to leave the country. The new virtual space. How thoroughly exciting. So let's get into it. What are we going to cover today, Daisy? We've got six sections today. So first of all, the introduction, who we are, where you can find us, then what the benefits are to studying overseas, um, the different types of programs you can do. This is where we'll talk to Alison and Ellie about some online programs that they've been involved with. Um, finances, how much it will cost, um, the application process, we're trying to demystify it all so that you can whiz through it when the time comes, and then we'll open the floor for questions at the end. Cool. Okay. Six little topics. So let's get into it. Introduction. First, who are we? What are we doing here? Why are we here? What are we looking forward to? What are we planning for? So the team leader who's uh, actually popped in today with a baby, uh, that's Marnie. Um, she's away on maternity leave, too much information, but uh, yeah, so she's away, kids can come out to play. It's Daisy and I, we're in charge today. So Daisy, you're the coordinator for Kayla and Cohn, maybe you can tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, so I'm Daisy, I'm from England originally, I did my degree in the Netherlands, and then from there I went on exchange to Canada. So I've lived the exchange dream that I'm trying to promote to you all today. Um, and I'll be looking after you if you're from the Colleges of Kale, so College of Arts, Law and Education, or College of Health and Medicine. Sweet. Uh, I'm Patrick. Uh, I'm originally from Tasmania. Um, I studied at, and continue to study at UTAS. I work in the Study Abroad and Exchange Office. Um, I'm the coordinator for COBE students, so the College of Business and Economics, and COSI, um, which sounds warm and lovely and is all about science and engineering. So we're the two coordinators to help students. Um, we're a resource for you guys. If you have questions, we're here to answer them as best we can and talk to you about what sort of programs are on offer for you uh, overseas. I've been on exchange as a Utah student, so I'm a huge champion for it. I believe in its transformational power. Um, yeah, we're here to help. Um, we we're also joined by, uh, maybe we could do, do introductions um, now for uh, Ellie and Allison. Uh, let's just do a, a mic check, I suppose. But uh, it's always <laughs> nice to meet uh, the people that we're working with and people that are passionate about what we do. So. Um, Alison? Yes, I can go first. I'm Alison Price. I'm the University Relations Manager for CIS Australia and we work very closely um, with the UTAS team. So yeah, looking forward to telling you more about um, what we have on offer and how we can support you today. Terrific. Thanks, Alison. Um, Ellie, are you about? Have you got, uh, got time to chat? So um, my name is Ellie. So I am in my last semester of a Bachelor of Business and Economics, so majoring in marketing and economic analysis. And so I have recently undertaken a um, virtual internship with CS Australia. So I'll be talking to you a bit about that um, later in the presentation. Cool. Thanks, Ellie. Familiar faces. <laughs> Alrighty. So um, maybe that, that, that's the people involved, but uh, what about the place? What about the team? So ordinarily in pre-COVID times, this was our office. Um, at the moment, we've not got that open because um, of staffing resource issues, um, but hopefully we'll be able to open that at some point this semester. We're not sure when yet, um, but otherwise we can be reached on Zoom, on email or on the phone. Um, but basically we're your one-stop shop for all your study overseas needs. We can help you find the perfect destination for you when the time comes um, based on what you study and what you want to get out of your exchange. Um, we can help you with the application process. 
We can also talk with the partner university on your behalf to make sure that everything's going smoothly and that you've selected the right units. So you're not just trying to hope for the best that it's all going all right. Um, and we also have a pre-departure session. So we don't let you just go off out into the world with no preparation. We try and prepare you as best we can with some cultural training um, and just giving you an idea of what you can expect once you're overseas. I like the part where we tell ghost stories about where things can go wrong and uh, we sort of diffuse, as David said, make sure that you don't get into trouble while you're overseas. Um, and more, cool. Um, so what's next? What are the benefits? Why study those overseas? I think, Alison, you'll probably talk about this a little bit um, in your presentation, so we'll whiz through these because it's, it'd be a shame to double up. Um, although there are so many benefits, I think that it probably takes uh, two or three different presentations mm -hmm. to cover up on it. But um, Daisy, so... We could scream about all of these till we're blue in the face, but here's just a few. So first of all, you, this is the only time in your life you'll get to travel whilst being a uni student. There are some great perks that come with being a uni student. You've got more time than if you have a job. Um, the government's giving you money to do it. Uh, so it's a really good opportunity to take. There's also a chance that if you're bored of your current life, I know we've all been stuck here for a while now. No one's gone on many adventures lately. Um, this is a great chance to seek out new challenges, adventure and some independence. It also improves your future career prospects. There are so many um, benefits that come from studying overseas in terms of employability. Lots of employers these days look for intercultural competencies and international experience when they're hiring. It also, um, students on average, when they come back from their overseas exchange, will have a higher GPA. Because um, I think people see more of the purpose in what they're doing. They can see the, the long-term plan after they come back. Mm. You create an international network of friends. I've got friends from all over the world now, um, which is really cool. And you also can get an international network of academics and people who might be great contacts for you later in life. Um, there's also a chance some of you might have never left Tasmania, you might never have lived away from home. This is a great chance to sort of prove it to yourself that you can do something really cool and go out there on your own and have, a, have an awesome experience. Experience a new culture and maybe learn a new language. You don't need to speak a new language. We'll talk on that later. But if you are studying a language, and I was speaking to some Japanese students at Society today, yesterday, or students studying Japanese, should I say, um, and I said the, the best way to become fluent in a language is to actually dump yourself in the deep end um, and live in your country. Mm. Immersion. To learn about. Yeah. And a really cool one, you can expand your knowledge. So Utah has, has got a wide offering, but there are some things we just don't do here. We've got some facilities that we just don't have. So this is your chance to go somewhere else and take advantage of the really cool options they have for different universities. So, so many benefits and bonuses. Um, so we field inquiries, we're a resource for students. We're here to answer questions. So we thought we'd sort of debunk or answer, maybe just like, yeah, detonate some questions for you guys. So there are heaps of myths, right? The myths around study abroad and exchange, which we, so Daisy mentioned um, a common question or, or fear from students is, oh, I don't speak another language. How could I possibly study overseas? So let's just unpick that quickly. Um, all of our partners um, all over the world, uh, whether on the Europe or Asia or the U North America, so USA, Canada, Mexico, um, all of those partners have programs in English. Uh, all over Europe, English is a strong second language. Um, we have partners in Denmark, so guess what? If you don't know Danish, chances are they'll have English programs for you. So programs in your, in your discipline, whether it's engineering, AMC, arts, law, education, you name it, there, there are programs in English, so don't fret. Um, but if you want to take this as an opportunity to learn a new language, you can do that. Too. Go for broke. <laughs> um, studying overseas is expensive. Now, this is this is true, but um, we'll talk about the financial uh, or different pots of money, financial assistance that is available to students. But there's all sorts of different scholarships um, and loans um, that are available to students, um, basically to, to to make it make it available. Uh, Centrelink as well, if you're a domestic student, that's another thing that can, can you continue um, while you're overseas. Um, another one is my degree will be extended. Like I want to get in, I want to get it done. I'm not here to mess around and travel. That's crazy. I'm here to study and just get in and get out. Um, so it's not about extending the duration of your degree. Before you study overseas, all the units, so all the classes that you're going to study overseas are pre-approved for credit. So that's just to ensure that you're not going overseas and gallivanting around, being all cavalier and wasting time, it just means that what you're studying is relevant to your degree. And so that way it's not extended. It's actually, yeah, it's vitally important. Four, I'm nervous to travel alone. Now, I think we all get nervous. That's a, that's a perfect reason um, or question to some article or, or, or statement. Um, most students apply with a friend, you know, a buddy, little Batman to their Robin or whatever. Um, 
But we're always here to help you out and, and assist you. If, you. if you've got worries or anything on the restock, I'm here basically to, 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 to help you out and make you feel comfortable. Also, when I went on exchange, just something specific about me is when I went overseas, you know, you've got housemates, so you've got people that are in exactly the same boat as you. So you're part of this really unique cohort of let's say hundreds, if not thousands of students in one destination, all, all just there for a brief time, all there for a semester or a year or shorter or longer. And so that's, you, I guess what I'm trying to say is you're not alone. Um, you're never alone, we're always here to help. Um, and the fifth one, I can't commit to a full semester. Well, there are short-term programs. That's why I've got Alison um, here to talk about some of the uh, some of the programs through CIS, but different short-term programs that you can do in, um, in winter, so July, so June to July, and in summer, so what, November, all the way through to February the following year. So that's just an intensive program, which you can count back towards an elective, which is a great way to study. If you want to keep going with that momentum of study from semester one, semester two, and then into the next year, it just means that you've got three units to study the next year, which means you can focus and really kick goals. And if you want to do it from the comfort of your own bed, we've also got virtual programs. Cowabunga. So what's next? Types of overseas Types of programs. programs. What are my options and where can I go? Cool, so I'm, I'll cover this one if you like. So um, types of programs, student exchange, um, that's a bit of a buzzword. So what does exchange mean? It's, um, I like to see it as we're just swapping students with a partner university. Um, so you continue paying tuition fees to UTAS and you go and study overseas for a semester or a year. So at UTAS, we have 140 plus different partners all over the world. So let's say exchange is back on, you can go and do face-to-face -face exchange overseas next year. Um, there's heaps of different options available to you. Um, there are scholarships, different financial pots of money, um, and you're covered by the UTAS insurance policy. So there's, that's a student exchange in a, in, a, in a quick and dirty sort of summary. Um, well, study abroad next. would be, is very similar to an exchange, but this is basically where if you look at all, our, all of our list of partner universities and none of them take your fancy, or you've got somewhere that you really specifically have your heart set on, you're more than welcome to go and study there. We're not going to stop you. But you, instead of paying your tuition fees to UTAS, you essentially take a leave of absence. You go and study at this host university. You pay fees to them, um, but we'll still make sure that your units credit back. This is less common, but we had Dana, for example, here, who's just had her heart set on studying in Russia last year, year before last. So that's what she did. Um, we've got limited uh, capacity to help you with these applications. because obviously we don't know every university in the world, so it'll be a bit tricky for us. Whereas with our partner universities, we have relationships with the, um, our equivalents at those universities. So it's a lot easier for us to help. Um, but by all means, you're welcome to go and have a do this if you want to. I recommend choosing a partner, but this is a good option. And last but not least, uh, short-term programs. So as, as we mentioned in those, uh, the, the myth-busting section before, some students don't have time or they've got other commitments so that they can't study overseas for a semester, right? So this is, these are intensive programs and they're a person, yeah, they're, they're really a perfect choice um, if you want to study overseas but can't commit to a full semester. So breaking this down into the three bold headings, right? So there's third party providers, so they're partners um, at CIS. So we'll sort of segue into Alison giving us a little bit of a breakdown about that. But in essence, they're intensive language programs or they're internships or they're placements. That's a good way to understand what third party providers offer. Um, there are summer and winter programs, which I mentioned briefly which are our partner universities, or likewise, again, Allison, CIS, um, they offer those summer and winter programs, which can generally count back towards an elective, um, and that's just during the break um, between those UTAS semesters. And then there's university-led programs, so NCP, the new Colombo plan. Um, I'll dive into that in a little bit. Um, there's, there's a fair bit to unpack, and we've only got a little bit of time, but those are the three sorts of short-term programs that I want you guys to think about. Third-party providers, summer and winter programs uh, through partners, and NCP. So um, maybe Alison, you could. Um, oh, we're on Ellie first. Oh yeah, hang on, let's do that. Ellie, Daisy's doing some tech stuff in the background. Yeah. Is that full screen for you? Sorry, I'm not sure. If yeah, we yeah, we've got you. Okay, perfect. Um, so as I was saying before, so I study a Bachelor of Business and Economics, and so I've recently done a virtual internship with CES Australia. 
Um, so the application process for me was super simple. Um, so they provided me with custom support to find me my perfect internship that aligned with my professional goals. So I knew that um, um, being in COVID times um, and not being able to get overseas, I really wanted something that's going to um, show employers that I took initiative um, to get some international experience. Um, so I ended up being paired with a host company in Los Angeles, California, where I was a social media and press relations intern. Um, so through that, I got to manage their social media for the period of my internship, um, write blog articles for their company website, um, audit their social platforms and create them um, a social strategy for their brand moving forward. Um, so I was given like quite a lot of so, uh, re responsibility, um, which was a super cool experience um, just to, you know, get to put all my knowledge into practice that I've learned throughout my degree and kind of have control over um, not control, but, you know, have the company um, want me to get as much value out of the internship as possible. Um, so as for like the social aspect of the um, internship, um, so I had weekly meetings with um, the CEO and fellow staff members, um, as well as um, meetings with um, the, the US um, CES Australia correspondent. Um, so I had Zoom meetings with other students um, undertaking um, similar internships. Um, so through that, we got to like discuss US culture. Um, so I think we discussed um, things such as like politics and healthcare and conducting business in the US. So it, was, um, it wasn't just sitting at home doing work and emailing it off. Um, it was very much you were meeting with people, um, getting to talk to people about their experiences, um, you know, meeting with company staff members, and really feeling like you're involved in the business. Um, and as well as um, that, I also had the opportunity in my internship to um, connect with businesses outside my host businesses, a business. So I got to sit in on a podcast recording for a massive retail chain in the US, um, which was like a super cool experience to be exposed to professionals, um, not just in my host company. Um, so the benefits I found from my program. I definitely um, solidified my career aspirations um, of where I want to go. Um, it was an opportunity, as I said, to put my studies into practice. Um, it was great experience for the resume. I've already had a few people um, say that it's great that, uh, you know, I took initiative um, in COVID times to um, do something like this and to get something on my resume, um, which is really great. Um, I also got a really good letter of recommendation from my um, host company, um, which I'm able to show employers. Um, and I've had a few people comment that that's really great as well. And as well as that, um, as I said, I made a lot of connections with people both in Australia and internationally. So I've definitely found those, you know, networks of people that um, I can follow through their business journey and um, connect with. And lastly, I also saw like a definitely, I saw a personal um, benefit from working within a company and just seeing my work um, getting put to good use and knowing that, um, you know, I feel equipped um, to take on some sets of professional role after university. So yeah, I definitely recommend the virtual internships. Nice, thanks so much, Ellie. And I think you're really onto something there saying that nobody's going overseas this year, nobody can travel. And so the fact that you've done that is gonna make you really stand out from the rest of your cohort. So that's something for everybody watching to take into consideration as well. That sort of passion, I think taking that passion and, and applying yourself is something that uh, employers really look uh, look favourably on. And when you can say um, and differentiate yourself as an applicant or and, and show just how you're more eligible than other candidates, I think that that's, yeah, as, as you say, Elliot, that's, um, that's, yeah, it's just terrific. Not only that you had a fantastic experience, but it's also um, going to sort of change your trajectory um, in the future with, with, with your career. Um, yeah. Thanks yeah, so much. Thanks so much. And I, I think that that's perfect because maybe Alison can then um, give us a summary or, 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 or talk to us a little bit about um, some of the some of the programs that are available um, at, at CIS. So we've got, yeah. uh, I've managed to, hopefully this is okay with you, Alison, but I've ripped your presentation onto this one just so that it's perfect. Um, nice and smooth. So and you um, should have control now so you can click through. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much to Patrick, Daisy and to Ellie, of course. So like I said, my name is Alison and I work for CIS Australia or Centre for International Studies Australia. So typically, if travel were free as usual and borders were open, um, we would send students on short term study, internship and volunteering experiences all around the world. However, um, unfortunately, due to that, we have had to pursue virtual alternatives so that we can still provide 
these amazing international experiences for students all across Australia. So we have come up with our virtual internships, which Ellie just talked about her experience. So I'm gonna share some more information about that with you today. There we go. Uh, perfect. So I'm going to go into some of the important benefits um, to virtual internships and why we think these are a fantastic international experience alternative for students given the current scenario around the world. So internships in general are just a fantastic way for students to be introduced to their preferred industry and to get your foot in the door and get real hands on experience as well as, as Ellie said, to boost your resume and your future career prospects. So unfortunately, as traditional in-person internships are no longer a viable option for most students at this point in time, these virtual internships are a fantastic alternative for um, students to get both international experience as well as work experience. So regarding that, young people entering the, worst, the workforce at the moment and in the very near future, we're about to enter a job market where the um, unemployment rate is um, the highest it's been in quite a while um, in terms of the history in Australia. And it's now more important than ever for students to be able to take advantage of every opportunity available to them to really set themselves apart from the rest um, and get your foot in the door for your future career. So for those students who really take the initiative during this time and go out into the workforce, employers are likely to really take notice of this and that will give you a huge advantage ahead of your peers when you're applying for graduate positions at the end of your time at UTAS. As well as that, you know, going forward, the ability to be able to work remotely is a skill that's gonna be really valued by employers. And now is the perfect time to be able to build on those skills and to showcase to future employers that you can work effectively in a remote and independent environment, as it could very well be the future of employment for many of us now. Um, so these international virtual internships allow you to work with a company based outside of Australia without having to physically travel there. And all of these internships will be done in English. So even though you'll be working with an international company uh, where a lot of the employees may not speak English, your direct supervisor will absolutely speak English. So this experience will provide students with many of the benefits of international work experience, but without so many of those barriers, such as visas and the high cost of travel to work abroad and all of those things that come with that. So another important thing is that um, these internships are available across a huge range of fields and they're completely unique and customized to each individual student. So it doesn't matter what you're studying, what kind of field you're interested in, what kind of country you would like to work within, no two virtual internships will be the same. So just to give you an idea of what your time throughout your virtual internship will look like, you'll receive an orientation on day one with your overseas internship manager. Um, and this will be completely online between you, your overseas internship manager and your company supervisor. And that will allow the company to set expectations and provide you with tasks and projects that you'll be working on throughout the duration of your internship. When the projects start, um, you'll meet one-on-one -on -one with your supervisor, either through Zoom or Google Hangouts or another platform that you decide, and you'll work together with your host company to determine the best time to meet with them, as there will, of course, be time differences between your destination country and here in Australia. And you'll talk about all about your, um, your ongoing projects. So you'll spend the rest of the week working on these projects, and you'll also attend you know, several more online calls with your supervisor to talk about your work to get recommendations, to maybe do some training um, and talk about things that you can potentially improve on and maybe some ideas you have um, to improve the company itself. So we always make sure that any project you work on is gonna offer the students challenging, stimulating and meaningful work, which means you'll be providing real benefits, um, not only to the company, but also to yourself. So the overall uh, internship will be primarily project-based, so either that's you'll be working on one large project for the duration of your internship or a number of smaller projects. And we always make sure that they add real value to the company. So you're not doing things like, you know, photocopying, getting coffees and that kind of stuff. You're working in a virtual environment. So the projects you get to work on are much more hands-on and much more significant, which is fantastic to talk about in your interviews with um, employers when you're going for graduate positions. 
On a weekly basis, you'll have check-ins with your overseas internship manager and your supervisor. You'll also have regular cultural immersion sessions, which Ellie talked about, so you can find out more about the country that you're actually doing your internship with. Even though you're not physically there, you'll feel somewhat immersed and as though you're learning about what it's like to do business in those countries. And then in the final week, you'll have your exit interview with your overseas internship manager and your company supervisor. And I'll do a bit of a review, provide you some feedback. And that's also a fantastic chance for you to ask for a written reference. Um, as Ellie mentioned, she got one. And I think something like that would be fantastic to include along with your resume and cover letter when you're applying for these jobs. So generally your internship will be for sort of 15 to 35 hours per week. Again, that's totally flexible. If you don't have so much time to dedicate to this, um, you sort of just wanna do it in maybe your evenings or your mornings before your classes at UTAS then you can just let us know at CIS Australia and we'll make sure we find a placement that will adjust the, um, the timing that you spend on it to whatever works within your personal and professional life. So now to just let you know which destinations we have on offer for these virtual internships. We've got five really exciting destinations all around the world. So the first is the USA, which Ellie took part in, and uh, this is our most affordable option, which is fantastic, starting at 1,799 Australian dollars. You can take part in an internship from four to eight weeks or longer if you, um, if you so choose. And placements for all of these, excluding Spain, which I'll go into later, they start on the first Monday of every month. So that means that you can apply anytime throughout this year and we can fit you in um, the next month, that month, whatever it is. We've also got South Africa. Again, we've got the price there, um, as well as the times that you can um, take part. And again, they start on the first Monday. The other two are China and Hong Kong and Japan. So we always like to have a couple of Asian destinations on offer. Um, a lot of the times, you know, universities might have some grants and that kind of stuff available from time to time. So that might become an option as well. Um, but these are two, again, really affordable destinations on offer for you. And, uh, oh, I must have, oh, well, anyway, we've also got Spain. Um, so I must have updated the slide since I uh, provided this to Patrick. So my apologies, but we do also have Spain on offer. The only difference is that Spain has set times throughout the year. So the next one starts in July and then the next one starts in August. So you can definitely apply for Spain, but they do have um, set dates for those as well. Now, as I said, applications um, are open all year round, so you can apply now, or even if you're just interested in learning a little bit more, I definitely encourage you to jump onto the CIS Australia website and uh, have a look at the program pages or just to submit an inquiry, and then we'll be able to get back to you with all of the, um, the program specifics and answer any questions that you might have. Um, but thankfully, we do have some time um, now throughout the presentation or a bit later on, um, Patrick will lead the way, where we can answer some questions. So maybe just hold on until we get that question section. If you put something in the chat, fantastic. I might get to that um, when we do get to the question time. But I just really wanted to share these experiences with you all so that you do know that there are these international opportunities on offer for you, even though you can't physically travel abroad. So thank you so much. And um, I'll stay on for questions later on. Thanks so much, Alison. Um, and something that you made a really good point about that I hadn't actually thought of myself is the um, showing that students can become good at re working remotely. That's going to be huge in the future because I think lots of workplaces are changing the way that they function. That's a really great point to make. Um, and yeah, if you've got any questions, hold on to those for Alison. We'll get to those at the end. Thank you so much, Alison. All righty, where, where to next on the globe? <laughs> Nice one. Okay. So um, cheeky little segue, I suppose. Alison talking about um, occasionally universities have um, little pots of money available to students that want to study in China, Hong Kong, Japan, um, within the Asia Pacific more broadly. So the NCP, what is it? Your ears should prick up. I like to think of it as the Australian government throwing money at students to go and study within the Indo-Pacific region. So that's 40 countries as decided by the Australian government where we want to strengthen ties. So the NCP then, it involves two distinctive types of programs. Okay, the first one is a prestigious scholarship valued at $67,000. Um, it's for both short 
sorry, it's for it's for a one year program, including an internship and mentorship and language immersion. And what this is about is, well, what's the point of being a fantastic um, straight A student? I suppose the the prestigious scholarship itself is that sort of carrot on a stick, that that um, maybe something to strive for, to keep pushing yourself to maintain that high GPA. Um, we have we can send out ten students per year, or um, that that can essentially undertake and will be awarded this um, this prestigious scholarship. So um, those will be announced later in the year. Um, you'll put in an expression of interest. Uh, we'll sort through the candidates, and um, ten lucky students will uh, receive that. Um, scholarship. So that's cool, very exciting. Um, and the second part of the NCP, the new Colombo plan, is the mobility, the mobility side, so flexible mobility grant program. That's where academics design programs within the UTAS curriculum for students to go and study overseas, face to face, or virtually. So stay tuned next, uh, next week and the following week. I'm going to be, um, let's say, spruiking or promoting to you guys the different, uh, the different programs that are available. Um, as NCP mobility funded programs. So really exciting, really intensive programs that can come back towards credit, towards your degree, which is exciting. Um, and you get a, a, a mobility grant. Um, don't think of them as scholarships because then you start getting muddled. So you get little grants, little pots of money to help you on your way um, into the Indo-Asia Pacific. Um, Daisy's just doing some more technical stuff. So, so I, I can't just read opened slides. another screen that's got um... Uh -huh. For the chat, yes, but I just want to make sure you're not all hearing double. Okay. I don't think you are because Alison's not pulled over face. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so the NCP, I uh, should have probably started with this, but the aims of it are to lift knowledge uh, and engage with the Indo-Pacific region. So think of it as soft diplomacy or it's, I went and studied in Hong Kong and now I'm so aware of uh, the life and the culture and the businesses and the politics in Hong Kong. So it's just forging those sorts of ties. And that's, that's what universities are all about. It's all about helping students to find out about the world around them as well as themselves and how we engage in the world. So th I think this is a huge part of the curriculum and it's really important to me, but it's also important to the university, so it should be important to you. Um, deep in Australia, so people-to-people -people relationships and institutional relationships, so partnerships uh, all around the globe, that's very important. Um, we see these sorts of international um, programs as a rite of passage. So this is something that you should, again, be, be proud of, that you can go and study overseas. Everyone wants to, everyone wants to hear about your study abroad program that you went on in your first or second or third year of your degree. But it's, it's this rite of passage. It's, it's this sort of coming of age story where you um, start to become independent and live and work and travel and study overseas. Um, and it's all about, this is, I, I suppose, speaking from the heart in the workplace that I'm currently in, uh, there are people from all different walks of life, different beliefs, uh, different values from different countries. So working internationally, you're going to meet people from all over the globe. And how do you interact with them and understand them and get along with them? I think that's a really maybe undersold, but also unexplored um, part of, of what comes with the experience of studying and traveling overseas. So a big part of the NCP, again, is about increasing the number of work-ready Australian graduates. So I'm going to go into the workplace and I'm going to be a functional human being. That's a really important aspect of the NCP exchange, study abroad more broadly. So that's just a snippet. There's so much more. But that's the NCP. Ooh, uh, oh, where's your mouse? My, lost my mouse. Let's well, moving on. Um, so the exchange parts. When students ask us about, like, where can I go and study? It can be a bit overwhelming. I apologise that you have choice. But we have partners in the North America, in the North, North America, America. Um, so the USA, Canada, and Mexico. So I look after uh, students going to those countries and coming to UTAS from those countries. Um, we've got Asia, China, Hong Kong, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, Korea, um, New Zealand. I'm trying to get some more partners in there. I'm listening to the students. I'm trying to get some partners there. We're working on that. That's very exciting. Um, with the Trans Tasman bubble in the, uh, in the pipeline once okay. once again. Um, and Europe, Daisy is my the. I am Europe. <laughs> I look after students coming from Europe and also will be able to give you some maybe more specialist knowledge if you are interested in one of those universities. Um, yeah, I'm not going to read them all because there's so many, but this gives you a good idea of where you can go. Basically, anywhere you want to go in Europe, we probably have a partner there, which is great. So going on to the finances. So um, as we mentioned if you're going if you're going to one of our partner universities um, that we have a 
formal agreement with, you'll keep paying your utilities tuition fees. So that won't change for you. It'll still be covered by your HEX. Um, so that's all normal. But then if you're doing a party run by a third party provider, such as one of the ones that Alison spoke about, or you're going to a university that isn't one of our partners, you will have to pay tuition fees to that host. But what's good about that is you won't be paying, if you're doing a virtual unit, for instance, through CIS, you won't be paying for that unit at UTAS. That will be one elective you don't pay for, and then you pay for it through the program. So the difference really isn't that great. Um, if you are going on an in-person real life exchange for a whole semester, we recommend you have $10,000 per semester of overseas study. So for those of you listening, if you're in your first year right now, we're hoping that by second semester of year two, you'll be able to go on exchange. Hopefully things will be somewhat back to normal by then. You can't go in your first year anyway. Um, so that's why we're preparing you for what it might cost. Um, so you need to take into consideration your flights, accommodation, visa, meal plan. This is something that's quite common in North America. They'll require you to pay for your meal plan up front at the beginning of the semester. So I know at my university I, in Canada, I paid about $3,500, $3,000. Um, and then that was a card that I had on a string and I could pay for all my meals with that throughout camp, across campus. You obviously get back what you don't spend. Um, the cost of living will vary depending on where you go. If you're going to Czech Republic, your life will be really cheap. If you go to Switzerland, it will be a lot more expensive. So obviously this depends on how much you want to spend. You can um, decide on your location based on that. Study materials, something else I got caught up with. Um, didn't remember that I have to buy some $400 textbooks when I got there. So it's really important to budget for that too. Um, health insurance, we do provide you with travel insurance through university for free, but lots of universities will require you to purchase their health insurance just to make sure you're covered. Um, the cost of public transport, do you need to, can you ride a bike for free? Do you need to pay for the tram or the bus? That will vary. Any side trips and extracurricular activities you want to do. So Joy here, who went to the University of Northern British Columbia, obviously paid for a lift pass for the season, so she could really make the most of that. If you know you're going to want to be traveling a lot, visiting all the neighboring countries, you're obviously going to need a bit more. Um, and if you don't want to travel, you can take it less. But luckily, as Pat will explain to us, there are lots of financial assistance options available to you for in-person exchanges. Alrighty, pots of moolah. So the first one on the list, the OS helpline. Don't be scared. OS just stands for overseas. Helpline. Overseas student. Overseas helpline. student helpline. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there are scholarships available and Centrelink, as I mentioned earlier. So the OS helpline. Let's say you're studying overseas. There are eligibility criteria that you have to meet, but the OS helpline is for domestic students or Australian students wanting to study overseas. This is funded by the Australian government. So $6,900 if you wanted to say, go and study in Canada, like I did on my exchange when I studied at UTAS. If you want to study in Asia, it's 8,300. So that's more money. These have actually gone up recently by a couple of hundred dollars each. So extra little <laughs> perks. Uh, if you want to do a language immersion or language study, you get an additional $1,000 and a little bit more on top of that. So these are large sums of money that the Australian government is willing to pay to students just to get them out and overseas because it can be expensive, flights, accommodation, things like that. It gets added to your hex debt, so you don't have to pay it back immediately. So get the money, worry about it later. Um, as I said, eligibility criteria must be met. Um, what's great about it though, is you can take out two loans. So when I went and studied overseas, my first semester took out just over six and a half grand. That was good, that helped pay for accommodation and my flight over. If I wanted to stay on for another semester, I could have taken the loan out again. And what's great about this as well is once you've met the eligibility criteria and you've been approved for it, you can spend it on whatever you want. So it doesn't have to go to anything in particular. If you want, you could buy seven grand's worth of hot dogs. It's really up to you. Great example. Seven <laughs> grand's worth of hot dogs. That's what I took away. Well, take it out. If you don't spend it, you can pay it back. Pay it back. <laughs> cool. Um, so scholarships, um, the word on everyone's lips. So there are different sort of a scholarships, different sort of a scholarships available at UTAS. Um, there's the Tasmanian Travel and Sea Scholarship, which is from $1,000 to $3,000, which is cool. The Estelle Marguerite, which is from valued at $3,000 to $5,000. That's what I got when I went on exchange. It's just talking about yourself and the benefits of getting the scholarship, which is nice and easy sometimes when you're Did inspired. Did you buy hot dogs with them? Didn't buy hot dogs with them, Daisy. Fancy that. Um, bought carrots. That was my, that was my meal of choice. Um, there are country-specific scholarships. Um, so let's say you're a student wanting to go and study in Japan, there are scholarships for that. The USA, there's a thousand dollar scholarship for students wanting to go to the USA. And then there's host specific. So host, people say the word host, 
It's just talking about who's hosting you, who's looking after you, where are you actually going? Um, so different university partners around the world will have different incentives for students to go and study at that university and, and not a different one. So uh, University of uh, Northern Arizona have a, have a little stipend valued at 500 American dollars. Exeter have something $1,000 for accommodation. Western Washington have a little bit more of a lucrative scholarship available to students which pays for their accommodation, which is, I think it's valued at something like maybe between four and 6,000 Australian dollars. So that's, that's good news. Um, there's also NUFS, Hawaii University of Foreign Studies. So if you're thinking about next year, you're thinking about where you might wanna go and if you might be um, uh, lacking sufficient funds to get you off the ground, some of these host universities that are offering scholarships are maybe a good place to start looking. Um, Centrelink. Oh, discipline specific. There's another one. Let's say you're a cozy student, science and engineering. Every, this is like an Oprah like Winfrey episode. Everybody gets a scholarship. So in the past, students that studied science and engineering, you're in luck. You get a $1,500 scholarship just for, just for being a student in that degree. So that's cool. Lucky, lucky devils. Um, Centrelink, this is something I'm, I don't know, proud of, but I was receiving Centrelink at UTAS. Um, when I went and studied overseas, those payments continued and increased because I was an independent living away from home. So again, if you're receiving Centrelink now, never in your life will the Australian government be giving you money to go and travel and study. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm going to say that. Great, nice one. <laughs> Getting some random feedback. Give me two seconds. No, just no, no, Right. Alrighty. Application process or eligibility. eligibility criteria. So there are a few um, different eligibility criteria we want you to meet. Oh. Um, we need you to meet. Um, so if you're doing a bachelor's degree, we need you to have completed 100 credit points of, um, or equivalent, or no, 100 credit points of your degree before you can go on exchange. So that's the equivalent of one year of full time study. You can apply once it's at, um, once you've got 50 credit points. So you'll be applying generally a semester in advance and when you go. Um, but by the time you leave the country, you do need those 100 credit points. Um, for virtual programs, we need you to have completed one semester or 50 credit points of full-time study. And you also need a GPA of four, that's a past credit average. So hopefully you should be okay with that. Um, obviously if something awful's happened and there's a really valid reason why your GPA has dropped, we're not going to be horrible and say you can't have a go. Um, we do take that on a case by case basis. And then finally, you'll have some course uh, college specific criteria. So your course information officer might say, yep, yeah, you can go on exchange, but you need to take one intermediate level science unit um, just to fulfill any major or minor requirements that you've got. Uh, there's a quick step-by-step -step on how to choose a host institution. So I think at the beginning, it might be a bit daunting looking at the list of universities and not knowing where to go. First of all, which is even before any of this, uh, it's off the slide to the left somewhere. I would say just think about is there somewhere in the world you've always wanted to go and have a look from there that can start the search off and then you need to look at is your degree or discipline offered at one of those universities if it's not it won't work and so many students come and apply and then afterwards realize oh wait they don't have science there they can't go um it seems simple but lots of people are fooled by it then you need to check if appropriate units are offered so if you know that you're going to be taking second or third year units you need to check that they're offering those units uh, for you to take in the right degree or the right field. And then you need to check that units are available in the semester you're applying for. The seasons are the other way around in the Northern Hemisphere. Their fall is our spring, spring is fall, winter is summer. People also get caught out by this a lot. We like to do this work before you apply so that then it saves time afterwards and disappointment. Double check that the classes are taught in English, it speaks for itself. Lots of students are caught up in that, caught out by that. Um, and are you maximizing your benefits by going to that university. Think really hard about what you want to get from your degree. Do you want to go somewhere like UCLA, that's a really well, highly ranked university and is going to stand out on your CV? Or do you want to go somewhere like Canada, like Pat did and ski every weekend because you're a passionate skier and you can't do it here because Ben Lomond isn't that great. It's really up to you. So make sure you're thinking about that really hard so that then you're not, um, generally people aren't disappointed. I feel like wherever people go, they have a great time. But it's something important to consider before you do choose. How do you apply okay, so this is just an overview of um, what it might look like, the different steps involved in going on an outbound overseas program. So you identify the best program to yourself. So as Daisy was saying, where do you want to go and why? Like, what are you studying? 
think about if you want to do a virtual program, if you want to do something semester based in the future, like years down the track, you consider your course, the cost and the location. Then you want to request your study plan. Okay, each student can be confusing, but we're just thinking about again what you're studying. You want to have that all mapped out a plan of what you're doing in your degree this year, next year and into the future. Okay, so do you have electives? Can you go on a CIS program with those electives? These are the sorts of things that we want you to start thinking about. What are you studying? So the third one is complete the UTAS exchange application form. You apply, it's pretty simple. It's all online. That's all online, you're welcome. Uh, you receive an offer letter from our team or from CAS or whoever, whichever program it is you apply to. They say, you've applied, you've filled out all the boxes, well done. So they'll send you an offer letter, you accept, you, uh, let's say it's an exchange program, you accept that offer from us and you're going on exchange, we'd say, okay, it's time for you to apply to the host program, CIS or what have you. Um, you receive an offer letter from them. So once you're accepted by that host program, um, you can see course approval. Now course approval, I could go on about it for days, but it's as simple as just making sure what you're going to study overseas counts back towards your degree. This is vitally important. This is what it's all about, to making sure everything you study is, it, it is equivalent to your studies at UTAS. Just make sure that you're not wasting time. You apply for financial assistance and scholarships. So that's down the track after you've applied, after you've got the name, your name in the system. Um, and then, yeah, you're pretty well away. Uh, I need to do some technical more. But yeah, you need to book some flights, you book your visas, Let's say you're going on an overseas face-to-face -face exchange in 2022 or 2023. Last but not least, you're booking flights, visas, and accommodation. All things to think about down the track. So you're all thinking, application yeah. deadlines. So for virtual winter school, we needed to apply um, with our virtual application form by March 15th. Semester two, 2021, although we've not fully officially confirmed that this isn't going, um, going ahead in person, it won't, um, but that would be March 15th. If you are doing a unit at a partner university online, that would be March 15th. You need to get those in by summer school, September 15th, and then semester one, 2022. Hopefully that will be in person. You need those by July 31st. Obviously, if you're doing a CIS internship um, that Alison has spoken about, they're running all throughout the year. So those deadlines don't really count for you. You just have to let us know that that's what you're applying for so we can make sure it counts back for credit. Um, I'm going to leave these up on the screen just so you can keep an eye on them while we do questions. 